Welcome to Plastic Model Mojo, a podcast dedicated to scale modeling, as well as the news and events around the hobby. Let's join Mike and Kentucky Dave as they strive to be informative, entertaining, and help you keep your modeling mojo alive. Dave, it's the middle of February, episode 110. Yep. We got Evan McCallum, Mr. Panzermeister, 36 in the third chair. Evan, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing very well. Thank you. How are you guys doing? Uh, I'm good. Dave's kind of tired. Yes, I am. I'm telling you. I wish it was because I've been modeling a ton, but no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Evan, since you're in the third chair tonight and our guest, uh, what's up in your model sphere over the last few weeks? Uh, my model sphere is looking really good. I'm in a similar position to, I'm sure, yourself, Mike, where finishing a project has really helped to give me a boost to the mojo and start some new projects and also focus on finishing some other ones off the bench. So I've had a, a lot of good progress on the model sphere recently. Well, that's good, man. Yeah. You can tell us what you started in the uh, Benchtop halftime report. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't know yet. <laughs> I haven't seen a video, so who knows? What about you, Dave? Well, I got to start off my model sphere with an apology to the guys at the Mid-Michigan Modelers. Back, I think it was at a, our last 12-minute model sphere, I said the first show in Region 4 was the Columbus Blizzard Con show. That wasn't true. Guys up at Mid-Michigan had one early in February. I think it might have been February 2nd, but I was unaware of it. Didn't think to look at the calendar before I said it. So my apologies to the folks at MidMichigan. Maybe Mike and I will have to make a, a pilgrimage up there one year to see the opening show in Region 4. Other than that, my model sphere has been fractured. Let's just say that. There's not a ton of focus to it. I have, as you know, I've been tearing apart my model room. I do think I've got some big progress in that regard that's going to help me moving forward. Uh, also, seeing you finish a kit actually both inspired and embarrassed me. You're 1 and 0 for the year, and I'm not. But uh, I have hope. I have, I have real hope. So... While it may not have been the best for the last uh, couple of weeks, I have big hope for my model sphere going forward. How about you, Mike? Well, for the non-modeling related activities, I've been doing a lot of stuff uh, related to the podcast behind the scenes. We've got some ideas we're kicking around and uh, solicited some uh, information and feedback from uh, from our Patreon subscribers or supporters right now. And I've been going through that and talking to some of those people. Just trying to figure out how we're going to get from point A to point B this year, Dave. <laughs> In style, man. One step at a time. <laughs> One step at a time. Well, on, on, on that note, uh, I've been playing around and we may actually end up with plastic model mojo uh, whiskey tumblers before all is said and done. So there's there's at least a little positive on the on the on the podcast front. Well, and you just segued yourself. <laughs> well, I was okay. Um, <laughs> speaking thanks, of whiskey tumblers. <laughs> speaking of whiskey tumblers, I'm assuming that we all have our modeling fluids to hand. Uh, Mike, what's your modeling fluid? Uh, I'm back with the old standby, the bullet. Oh, okay. I might have spoiled myself. It's been a little rough coming back to that one. Uh, more more stepping, on that later. You're stepping down a price point. Uh, that's for sure. That's yeah. what I'm drinking. Evan, what are you drinking? So I have a nice German import here. This okay. is Zwicko Keller beer. And this is actually from Germany. My good modeling friend, Hamilcar Barkas, who listens to the podcast and uh, he's one of my YouTube modeling buddies, of course. He sent me some stuff back in October, including beer that he likes. Uh, I'm not sure if that was legal, but it made <laughs> it. 
<laughs> and uh, I've saved up one of them for a modeling fluid here. So as a Keller beer, this should be an unfiltered lager as I take it. And the most interesting thing about it to me is that it has a resealable swivel top cork plug oh, yeah. plastic thing. Like you see on a maple syrup bottle usually. Yeah. Like it's so that they can reuse it, I guess. But yep, a lot of a lot of European beers come with that thing with the little ceramic and and rubber stopper at the top with metal yeah. cage that rotates it so that you can drink it and then reseal it. Yeah, it's like someone made it in their basement. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I will be enjoying this. Thank you very much, Michael. Yes. Right. Where do? How do I get a friend who'll send me beer from Germany? That that sounds like a heck of a heck of a deal. <laughs> what about you, Dave? Well, I am actually doing a repeat. I know that I have actually had this as my modeling fluid once before on the podcast. This is Ace Perry Craft Cider from Ace Brewing. Uh, da- out at uh, out in California, and uh, Mike, you may remember this. I discovered Ace for the first time when you and I were at the Oklahoma City Nationals in 2003, yep. and we went down to Brew Works and they had this on tap. And I've been a fan ever since, so I know I'm going to enjoy this. All right, we'll catch up on all these at the end, but for now, we better like some listener mail. You got it. Some of these are questions, some aren't. Evan, you're free to comment on any of these you like, as usual. Absolutely. First up, Stuart Malone from Kansas City, Missouri. I bet he's happy if he's a football fan. Yeah, really. (laughs) Or a Taylor Swift fan, for that matter. (laughs) Well, whatever, man. (laughs) He enjoyed meeting us in Texas and hopes to do it again in South Bend and or Madison. Well, hopefully it's going to be and. We'll we'll see. Yeah, we're we're trying. Uh, he's asking if he could uh, get a shout out for their upcoming show. And, uh, well, certainly, certainly, Stuart, we can do that. It's uh, KCCon 2024, March 9th at the Kansas City First Church of the Nazarene, 11811 State Line Road, Kansas City, Missouri. Now, there's a URL for the contest page. Dave, I'll forward that on to you. It's, that's okay. uh, a lot easier to find in the show notes than to remember it from the episode. And they've expanded uh, their armor categories this year to have a dedicated 16th scale and larger. Oh, wow. Instead of 35th and larger, which I think has been customary forever. I think that's a really good idea because a lot of those categories are getting pretty heavy with large scale stuff now with all these new kits coming out in the past three years. Yep. Yeah, there's no shortage of them and they're starting to show up in bigger uh, and they take up a lot of space on the table too, so you know. <laughs> well, see, and aircraft modelers went through this about 10, 12 years ago when the 32nd scale jets started mm-hmm. to become really popular. And then you had a table, and it doesn't take many 32nd scale jets to fill up a table. And so I imagine that's the same thing you're going to experience with 16 scale armor. Up next, Steve Anderson from Matamita, Minnesota. And uh, he says we're off to a great, great role for 2024. Well, I hope so. Thank you for that. We're trying. We certainly are trying. Uh, he built an old Ravel 48 scale 109 G10 out of a stash. He's had about 20 years. Low part count, low expectations, but sometimes building up a kit without worries about the details is just what you need. Yep. I completely agree with that. He said he wasn't, you know, much of a, bf 109 guy until he kind of built this kit and it kind of flipped flipped the switch in his brain and he realized you know what a nice looking plane it was so uh he's got a question have you ever built a kit that made you appreciate the real thing in a new way or have you ever built a kit that gave you more negative view of the original interesting yes hmm. evan do you have a story do you want to take that one first or do you want me to uh you, you go ahead first okay it not exactly the model but I I built that, to me, a Mosquito. You know, the Mosquito to me had never been uh, a particularly interesting aircraft. I mean, it's, it's amazing, the history, the, the technology and all. It just, it never really spoke to me. And then back in 1988, 
the IPMS Nationals was in Dayton, Ohio, and they had a special uh, deal with the Air Force Museum that on Friday night after the after the museum closed, they reopened it just for people attending the, the Nationals. And they took down all the ropes and opened up some of the aircraft, and you could crawl inside the cockpits of, of all these aircraft. And one of the ones I got in was the Mosquito that they have. And it was amazing how tiny that was. I mean, I was in street clothes, no bulky flying gear, no no parachute, no nothing. It was amazing how tight it was. I cannot imagine getting in and out of that aircraft, much less trying to get out of it in an emergency. And that kind of gave me a new appreciation for that aircraft and what they were doing. That came back to me when I built that uh, to me a mosquito uh, a year or two ago, or when I finished it a year or two ago. It just, I, you looking into that tiny cockpit and then remembering back, it really did. It really gave me a much more positive view of, of the mosquito. What about you, Evan? Uh, for me, mainly I will build a kit because I'm already very interested and invested in the vehicle. Mainly I've you know found a cool photo, done some research beforehand, and then I find the best kit. So that's generally the case. It's almost the opposite. But there have been some, especially this thing I'm working on right now, which we'll get into in the, the halftime report uh, later, where it was a vehicle I knew nothing about. And then as I started to kind of get invested in the kit and decide maybe I can make this a little bit more detailed and special, I, I became more and more interested. And I've actually now ordered some other modern Chinese armored vehicles, uh, which are currently residing in Kentucky Dave's house <laughs> 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 to be delivered for heritage gone. <laughs> yes, they are. I don't know. I I'm kind of like you, Evan. I, I tend to be really heavily invested on the front end. Yeah. Uh, certainly there's nothing I've built that made me like a subject less. There may have been a kid I've built that made me like the, the manufacturer less. <laughs> <laughs> that can always happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's looking at you, Alan. Uh, maybe. <laughs> oh, I, so no, I don't. I don't think there's one that I can think of that uh, made me appreciate it more up front or after I got into it. So I'm usually already there. All right, moving on. We got some Kentucky trivia. All right, Thomas Karen from Kearns, Utah, reminded us that the. Uh, First Kentucky Fried Chicken location was not in Kentucky. Yes and no. <laughs> the first franchise was not. Right. It was in Salt Lake City, Utah. Yep. Indeed and, it uh, was. And I don't think Harlan Sanders Roadside was called Kentucky Fried Chicken at all. It, so It was not. So That's right. I think but he's right. <laughs> it's where he originated KFC. Cause it, it, that location now, by the way, is a KFC, and I've actually been to it on a number of occasions. But yes, the first restaurant called Kentucky Fried Chicken was actually a franchise opened in Utah. So they should take that Kentucky Colonel out of the airport that I landed at. <laughs> no, 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 no. And no, move no. it. <laughs> you, you, can, you can have the Colonel when you pry him from our cold dead hand. <laughs> Up next, uh, William McCullough from uh, Dallas, Georgia. Uh, he wanted to say how much he'd like. Well, first off, um, he wanted to uh, extend his condolences to uh, James Corley. Yes. His family. Uh, he said he spent many hours in AAA hobbies and I remember James well. Yep. Hadn't seen him in a number of years, but uh, will certainly be missed. Yes, definitely. Uh, the rest of the episode was a joy listening to Brandon talk about uh, the reincarnation of Squadron. The only regret he has is now he's realized that the squadron's only 90 minutes from his house. <laughs> <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, right. Well, he doesn't need to go to Squadron World Headquarters to have that problem. Uh, he was down at a show recently. Oh, this is Atlanta Figure Show. I think that's yeah. the one that was held in conjunction with the Amps show, too, down there just last yep. weekend. Yep. Squadron was there, and the Brandon got some of his money there. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm going to double up here. Uh, Jonathan Bryan from uh, Croydon in the UK and uh, actually 
Chris Mettings both had similar comments. Chris hit us up through the messenger. I may, it may have come directly to me. I can't remember. But anyway, uh, the, the theme was they, they saw the episode title or something to that effect and uh, it being a, about a business that they really couldn't relate to, you know. Mm-hmm. They may have not ever done business with Squadron or didn't have the same nostalgic hook that it has with so many people uh, in the modeling community in, the, in, in North America and, and the United States in particular. Uh, but Brandon being such a good storyteller that uh, ended up being very enjoyable. Yep. He really does tell that story well. And I got one more on that same vein. Brandon Jacob, our Mojovian special agent. Yep. Uh, same kind of comment. actually cut a little bit out of his email and sent that to Brandon because he had some good comments. But so thank you folks. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a different episode. It wasn't really about anybody's modeling or some technique or anything in particular. It was just uh, the story of squadron coming back to us. And uh, we wish Brandon all the success with that. Absolutely. Don Gilman in college station, Texas. Now this is kind of in the friendly vein, David It's directed toward you. <laughs> Why is Dave committing to build to Mike or the listener, Dave, it's your hobby, not your job. It isn't vows to your wife. It's supposed to be fun. You <laughs> sounded so pained and he felt bad. Felt your statement was misplaced. Your life, your bench, your call. Don in College Station. Well, I appreciate that. And yes, I I do think that is something that can happen to modelers, that they they set goals for themselves. And then when they don't reach those goals, they feel disappointed in themselves, which is the exact opposite of what you want out of a hobby. I appreciate his concern. I am taking it in the spirit that it is occurring. Actually, as far as, while I haven't been making as much progress as I've wanted, my overall attitude and enjoyment of the hobby is actually better than ever. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's really due to the the listeners. There is now not a day that goes by that at some point during the day, I don't have a DM or a text or a Facebook post message with one or more of our listeners. And it never fails to, to make me happier to make the day brighter so i appreciate his concern and yes while i am failing uh or or not not meeting what i want to as far as modeling progress overall i'm enjoying the hobby a heck of a lot and finally guys from the email side of things mr michael karnaka from new york city Okay. He wants to know if we can recall a time where you saw a vendor online or at a show or even perhaps a retail location, a brick and mortar, charge a really insane amount for a kit that isn't worth what they're asking, or it may even be still in production and readily available. Oh, yes. (laughs) A lot. I'll tell you what really shocks me these days is when you go into a brick and mortar hobby store and the all the kits are not just msrp but msrp plus that's that's something i see with some regularity i don't know i've seen the msrp plus uh evan how's things in canada uh probably a lot like it is for you guys where kits in stores can tend to be expensive but you can also find good deals where collections have come back into the store and they're being you know resold essentially uh but i don't mind spending maybe a little bit more at the brick and hobby store than i would if i bought it online somewhere because i I like to be able to fondle the the boxes in the store and look through that and also support my local business so not exactly a big deal but there there can sometimes be kits where you see the price and you're not really sure why it is so high but some modern kits now, they're really expensive because there's lots of goodies in there. Yep. I think for me, it's it's not just the the occasional high price you might see, like Dave said, MSRP Plus. It's the how complicated it seems. You 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 can see a kit. There's like three tiers of pricing. There's there's like the the price is being offered by whatever American distributor is actually the official importer for a particular brand. Mm-hmm. Then you got the price from. Uh, everybody else online 
And then you got the brick and mortar price and it can vary widely. I, I just, there was a kid I picked up recently that was uh, even discounted to some degree off MSRP it was still way more than uh, the online retailer who's actually the importer for that brand was selling it for. And I think some of this, Mike, has to do, and this might be a conversation for uh, Brandon. I think that back before the internet, before global trade, before eBay from China or whatever, it was much easier for manufacturers to enforce MSRP on the distributors and the distributors to enforce MSRP on manufacturer suggested retail price for those who might not know that that because the supply chains were very siloed they could enforce that and discipline anyone who tried to vary from it by not supplying to them and now with all of this world trade and the internet and global shipping that a lot of that control has just disappeared well, what's the uh, Facebook Messenger looking like? Well, we've had a few. Kevin Hedrick reached out, and he knew that uh, I'm working on getting up to speed on the Cameo, and he reached out to help. He pointed me to the ability to uh, upgrade the software with a uh, price discount. He also sent me a uh, Canopy mask file for the Tamiya Zero. And gave me a few other helpful tips and offered to offered to do more. So that was very helpful, and that's helping my learning curve uh, with the Cameo. Jeff Adair from Georgia listened to our episode, Squadron episode, and he, like like the listener who wrote in, he lives sixty to ninety minutes from Squadron's new world headquarters. And he actually DM'd some photos from the warehouse. And he said that, uh, you know, it's it's not unusual for him to go up and actually pick up an order at the warehouse. So that's that's mighty cool. That is really cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. You'd have to really be disciplined because I could see myself oh, it's only an hour up the road. I'll just run up there and see what they and that, <laughs> that could lead to bad things. Uh, listener Charles Rice sent in a photograph. He's been working on, he knows you like Russian stuff. He was working on a T-26 in 72nd scale uh, from Pegasus models and was saying that uh, price for, for the value, he was really enjoying them. And he sent on pictures of uh, one from the Spanish Civil War, just because he knew you you had an interest in all things Soviet. I think those are the typical two-in-the-box. Yeah, I think they are. Kind of simple kits geared for uh, tabletop gaming, maybe? I, I think that they are. Like Armor Fast is another brand? Yep. Our Spanish listener that we referenced previously, Alvaro Mag- Magalon, uh, Magion, I'm, again, Alvaro, I apologize. My Spanish pronunciations are every bit as good as Dave Goldfinch's. He wrote back to, he enjoyed hearing his name and the, his story on our previous episode. And he, he DM'd back to tell us that not only is he listening to us, so maybe getting English with a Southern accent, uh, his English teacher in Spain is Scottish. <laughs> so between that and listening to our podcast, I have no idea what kind of English accent he's going to come up with, <laughs> but, it's a, but it's an entertaining thought. And uh, finally, Christian Gurney from Bases by Bill did me a real solid, partly I think because he's tired of hearing me talk about the the F-8 Crusader. He he made a base for the Crusader and sent it to me, and gosh, it's beautiful. They're, they're trying some new stuff. It's just really, really impressive what they are doing. He said that they are manufacturing awards for clubs so if there are clubs out there who 
have a local contest or are putting on a regional and want distinctive awards, you can contact the Bases by Bill guys and they'll try and work with you to come up with some very unique awards for your contest. Is that it? That's it. When you're done listening to this episode, we'd appreciate it if you would go to Apple Podcasts or uh, whatever podcast app you listen to the to the show on and give us a, a rating. We'd appreciate it if you rate us five stars to help us become more visible to more people. Additionally, if you would go to one of your modeling friends who does not listen to a podcast and recommend our show and maybe help them set it up so that they can start downloading podcasts, we'd appreciate it. The best way for our show to grow is a recommendation from somebody who's currently a listener. So Mike and I would appreciate it if you'd do that. And once you're done with that, please check out the other podcasts out there in the model sphere. You can do so by going to www.modelpodcast.com. That's model podcast, plural. It's a consortium website set up with the help of Stuart Clark at the Scale Model Podcast up in Canada. And if you go to that URL, you can find banner links to all the podcasts out there in the model sphere participating in this spirit of cross promotion. In addition to that, please check out all our blog and YouTube friends out there as well. Got Jim Bates of Scale Canadian TV, just finished up his big show out in the Seattle area and had a recent episode on YouTube. Yep. Chris Wallace, model airplane maker. You're going to check out his YouTube channel and his blog. He's always got something good. He's been finishing up that Corsair base. That's worth watching. Spree Pie with Fret, Stephen Lee, long and short form blog. Always some good information there and uh, follow his builds. And you can also check out his long form blogs for some insight into whatever's the hot topic in the model sphere. Jeff Groves, the inch high guy, all things 72nd scale. I think he just finished up a crazy, uh, well, it's not a B-17. What is it? It's an XB-38. Okay which was a heavily modified B-17 experiment during World War II. Well, his was kind of a hodgepodge what if, I think. Right, because he combined it with another uh, experimental set of experiments that they, experimental modifications that they tried on the on the B-17. It was very cool. Yeah, it's it was. way cool. And finally, Evan, Panzermeister 36, I'll let you tell us what you're up to. Oh, my YouTube channel is Panzermeister 36, where I do mainly builds and painting and weathering of 35th scale armor, mostly World War II stuff, but some modern stuff coming soon because I found some very interesting photos that I want to replicate. So always new stuff to try out. If you are not a member of IPMS USA, IPMS Canada, IPMS UK, or wherever you happen to live, your national IPMS chapter, please consider joining IPMS as an organization, as an international organization, strives to make the community experience for the modeler better through the organization and support of chapters, through the coordination of contests, putting on a national contest. Most IPMS national organizations also put out a magazine. So if you're not a member, please consider joining. All right, guys, let's slip a word in from our sponsor. Plastic Model Mojo is now brought to you by Model Paint Solutions, your source for harder steam back airbrushes, David Union power tools, and laboratory-grade mixing, measuring, and storage tools for use with all your model paints, be they acrylic, enamels, or lacquers. Check them out at www.modelpaintsolutions.com. All right, guys. Ready to have some fun? I am ready for this. (laughs) Absolutely. I've looked forward to this particular episode for a solid month. I've known we were were going to be doing it, and these are always so much fun. All right. Well, folks, if you saw the uh, teaser graphic for the episode, you know we we're spinning the wheel of accidental wisdom here again tonight with Evan. And uh, to give a little uh, background on what's changed, 
I've tried to add a little more context to the questions and set them up with a little more detail to make them a little more fun. After this episode, if folks want to submit some new ones kind of along the same lines that I've done these for this episode, uh, please submit them to us at plasticmodelmojo at gmail.com. Well, guys, let's Let's spin the wheel. Let's go. Got a new wheel, too. I was going to say the (laughs) wheel has changed. (laughs) A build for the ages. You've studied and evaluated every remotely related kit, bought all the reference books, and all the aftermarket you can get your hands on. It's time to pull the trigger on your magnum opus. What is it? Evan, you go first. Well, it would have to be a Stoke 3, of course, because I already have all the kits and aftermarket and research (laughs) material and and knowledge in my brain. But which Stoke 3? What version? Now, I have had this big plan that I'm like, I want to build one of every major variant of the Stoke 3. And so I made an Excel spreadsheet to identify which variants are significant enough to have their own build. And I came up with about 36 different Holy things. Moses. So then I very quickly decided maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> so I might stick with just all the Ausfrung G, which is only like 20 oh, major man. variants. It gets complicated. Like there's, you know, certain months they change things and then you have to zimmer it and you have two different factories making them and there's all these changes that keep happening, different camouflage patterns, ambush camo, hard edge. It's once you start digging deep into something. You just keep finding more and more, and it almost gets more complicated and harder to narrow down exactly one one individual build, at least, if, for what I'm trying to do. So I don't think I'm ever going to actually get to that because I've already started, and some of the ones I built like three years ago for this concept of all, all 20 major variants, uh, they're already like outdated. I would have to redo that to make it to my current standard, and... You know, by the time I finish the one I'm working on now, three years from then, it's going to be outdated and it's it's just never going to end, right? But that's that's yeah. our hobby. You know, if, if I had a Magnum Opus build and I was done, that would have essentially ruined the hobby for me. I always <laughs> need something to drive me to keep building more and more new stuff. So that's my Magnum Opus and I'll probably never achieve it, but it's at least something to keep working towards. Yeah, it's a, it's a target to work work towards and there's nothing wrong with getting to the end of it looking back at the ones that you did at the beginning and going i need to i need to do new versions of that so you just keep it going it'll keep me occupied for the next 50 years let's say there you go yeah no kidding there you go all right dave no you you go okay oh gosh there are so many (laughs) that's the problem with it if i had to pick one it would be Kind of like Evan, I would like to do the entire KI-43 Oscar series. Now, it probably wouldn't be 36 or 20 different variants, but uh, the Oscar went through a bunch of changes over its production life. And I'll bet you there's at least 15 different variants. And I've got kits for a lot of them spaced widely across manufacturers, everything from fine molds, really good stuff to third party uh, short run manufacturers. If I had to pick one, it would probably be the KI-43 series, which I have yet to build a single one of. Now, the KI-43 actually is an aircraft that I for some reason, have never really gotten any interest in, even though I love World War II Japanese aircraft. So maybe you can give me some inspiration. That could be my I, aircraft I, I, build I could do. There, there you go. I, I would love to do that. It's going to be 48th, though. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> who knows? By the time you get around to building it, it might be 35th. Yeah, border. We're starting to see all those <laughs> aircraft being manufactured in 35th scale. <laughs> nice proper scale. Yeah, right. So, Mike, magnum opus. Every one of yours is a magnum opus. Well, that's not exactly true. The, the one I'm really planning and putting a lot of time into thinking through it, and you know, like I've always talked about before, building it in my head is this uh, Zis six based Katusha truck launcher. Mm, yeah, 
that one's on deck. I think that one's going to happen. That's like a three kit kit bash and some aftermarket. And I don't have a lot of books, but there aren't a lot of books, but I think that's, that's, that's the one that's going to be next for me. I wonder how what? come there's not a lot of reference for it. I don't know. What about Which, your uh, Hungarian Rabo baton truck? See, that's that's all from scratch. That's exactly uh, that makes it even more magnum opus because exactly. you're doing that from nothing rather than at least from three kits. Yeah, call me out, man. Who let him on here? <laughs> yeah, I think that was you could have more than one magnum opus. I have thirty six apparently, <laughs> or at least twenty. Well, the collective is your magnum opus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. That's just a slow going. I don't know. We'll see if that ever happens. It looks to me like you've got a tire. I almost have a tire. That's right. Which and, is kind of, and and part of a frame. You're uh, going to get about 90% of the way through the full CAD. Yeah. And then IBG is going to announce it in 35th scale. <laughs> that, that could very well happen. Yeah. <laughs> At least you'll be able to make some good aftermarket yourself for it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We beat that one to death. Let's do it again. Ooh, a new book. And this is from Michael Karnaka in New York City. All right. A pricey new book on a favorite subject of yours has just been released. It is lavishly illustrated with scores of photos, but a high percentage of those photos can be found across all the other reference books you have on the subject. There's a dozen or so that have never been published before, and most of those are quite good and very useful. However, the book is published in the native language of Spotsylvania. <laughs> Do you buy the book? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah unless it's a thousand dollars, right? Yeah. I'm a freaking librarian who models. So, yeah, I would be unable to resist that. Not long ago, made that exact purchase. Oh, I've got a couple. I do this all the time. I don't care. Yeah. And with modern, like I can hold up my phone to a page now and use Google Translate through my, my camera and it can translate Elbonian to English, and it's pretty good. I mean, there might be technical words right. that are not translated correctly, but you can get the you know, like probably 90% of the information, including dates, which are quite relevant, uh, just by taking a photo with your phone. It's it's pretty incredible. Yep. And pictures, of course, are very inspirational for me, so that's mainly what I would be looking for in the book. I agree. I've got books in Russian, German, French, Polish, Czech. And a lot of them don't even have English captions in them. And that, you know, yeah. I, I don't care. That's never stopped me before. Usually the price yeah. is what stops me. You just like to look at the pretty pictures. That's right. I, I can't read. Well, just a, a few months ago, I bought a Japanese book. You know, I'm doing, working on that A7M. I bought a Japanese book specifically because this book had eight or nine new photographs of the A7M that weren't published in any other book. And they're under construction photos of the aircraft. But it's, yeah, I've, I've, I'm working on this. I want to see those. And I paid probably a ridiculous amount to get them. But <laughs> yeah, uh, when it comes to books, this is a no-brainer. <laughs> Time waits for no man. This is from Peter Kwong, Vancouver, British Columbia. Now, Evan, this is one where you're going to get a little wisdom, maybe. Okay. <laughs> don't don't know what your <laughs> don't know what your answer to this one's going to be, but uh, you'll have something to say. Most of us here in Mojovia dream of the builds we're going to do. We buy the subject kit at a rate that outpaces our finishes. All done with the good intent to build them someday, but alas, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And a great sage once said, "You better learn fast. You better learn young, because someday never comes." For those modelers who are hitting 60 plus or near it, has the impending mortality changed how you approach the hobby? As the oldest person on this podcast and a person who has reached the ripe old age of 60 and gone a little past it, absolutely, 100%. In fact, the builds that I intend to do this year are absolutely all model almost all models where i have been putting them off because you know again i'll build that when i get better <laughs> and i realize that i may only have 10 or 15 years of modeling in me 
then again, I may suddenly blossom into Steve Hustad and miracles happen. But <laughs> assuming that's not going to happen, I'm starting to build the kits that I really want to have models of now rather than putting them off until someday. So yes, absolutely, mortality is looking me in the face. Yet I still do buy kits. So, <laughs> you know, although I do get rid of kits too. So it's it's a, I wouldn't say it's exactly an equilibrium, but it, the acquisition has slowed. <laughs> what do you think, Evan? Uh, well, as the youngest member currently on this podcast at the ripe old age of 25, oh. uh, <laughs> a knife slipped in the back. <laughs> Youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> uh, I I mean, I, I think about this a little bit because I know most of my modeling buddies are much older than me, maybe twice as old as me or more. And they tell me, you know, they've had this kit in the stash for 30 years and they're never going to build it. Uh, and I don't really want to become that. I try to keep my stash quite pared down. So even now, if something's been in the stash for five years, uh, I, I'll sell it. I'll get rid of it. I, I when I, once I realize I'm not going to build it, I don't think there's any value in keeping that anymore. And I don't want to become the guy with 3,000 kits in his basement. So I got rid of a, a tank recently, and uh, we can get into this in the later section on what broke your wallet. But I traded it for something else, and I have no regrets. I, I initially bought it, planning to build it, but I realized never going to build it, so get rid of it. That's a good, healthy attitude, Evan. I have one project I have that I keep putting off as I'll build that when I get better. Um, only one that is in that situation. That's a striker mortar carrier with a full interior. It's got 850 parts and there's no track links. Like that's usually 300 parts of a kit. So it's a beast. And I've got all the resin for the inside outside extras. And I need to also scratch build some ammo racks for it too, or something. It's going to be almost a magnum opus build when I eventually get to it. But I try to keep things like I, I, I want to, if I want to build it, I'll build it. If I realize I'm not going to build it, I'll get rid of it. I, I don't like that idea of I'll build it when I get better. You should probably build it now while you still have the passion and are going to enjoy it because you might decide you don't want to build that when you're better. And then you've wasted all this money on the aftermarket for it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's a good attitude. Mike? I kind of waffle. I don't think it's affected the way I build. I certainly hadn't stopped my buying, but, uh, you know, I've been through phases where I've pared down the stash and now it's kind of going the other way again. I still don't have as many <laughs> as I had, but, uh, have I've you ever bought a kit, sold it, then rebought it and sold it? <laughs> not, not twice, but I've bought, sold and rebought. Yeah. Had, yeah. Cause some interest came back and it's probably one I should not have gotten rid of. I couldn't pass it up. You know, it's one of those deal deals. And I tell you which one it was. It was the, uh, at the premiere edition of the of Dragon's King Tiger with the uh the Porsche turret version of that with one. With the molded with the molded Zimrit or the original one? Uh no, it's the original one. It's but that one's got all the the crazy the amount of all the goodies in it. The goodie card yeah. in that one's like the size of the same footprint as the box. Yep. Yeah, so I I, I, I bought that one again. The so. Porsche turret is the correct turret. For the no, King it's Tiger. the initial turret. Yes. <laughs> it's the correct turret. <laughs> it's the best looking one, but it's the best uh -huh. looking turret by far. <laughs> shot trap or no shot trap. It does look cooler. Yes. My favorite part, and this was from Preston Culp near Wichita, Kansas. The hobby of scale modeling brings a, a lot with it. Buying and building, the shows, contests, and clubs, etc. We can certainly enjoy all those aspects of the greater hobby. To the actual act of building scale models, the tactile act of doing it, what is your favorite part and why? I'll jump off first because it's changed. When I was young Evan's age, I was all about getting the model together, done to the point where it was getting painted and decaled. And that was the part that I enjoyed the most. Everything up to that point, construction was just a way to get to the point where I'm painting and finishing it. 
I am exactly the opposite now. I enjoy the, what I refer to as the zen of construction, cutting parts off the sprue, sanding attachment points, cleaning up, test fitting, uh, gluing together, uh, sanding. That to me is now the relaxing part of the hobby, the part I enjoy the most. Now, that's led to a problem, which is I get to the painting and construction and then like, oh, I'd rather go do what I enjoy. So I'll get another kit out and start sticking pieces together. So that's a downside. Is that really a problem if what you enjoy most is building, though? That That is actually, that's actually true. You don't need to the, finish kits to be successful at this hobby. It's just a hobby, right? You're just right. supposed to be having fun. That is absolutely true. Viewed in one way, the fact that I enjoy that part of it, so I do that part of it and don't get as many finished, still does provide me enjoyment. Now, yes, I've I've got some guilt about not getting finished. And as my podcast partner will tell you, finishing has a certain... Um, mojo enhancing effect all its own so i I, i'm still working with that but yeah no your point is well taken if i built what i have and never finished completely finished another model but i really enjoyed all the time at the bench doing that yeah that's that's a good hobby mike i like the build and the problem solving part of that but I think I'm on the crux of at least a, a partial pivot toward the paint and finish because uh, that was the the big part of the the model building process that kind of derailed me for all those years because it all yeah. kind of changed in a very short period of time. Well, versus my typical construction duration, it changed within the, <laughs> the span of one kit build for me. Yeah. At least it seemed to have. Uh, I'm starting to get comfortable in my own skin again, uh, you know, with the airbrush and and stepping up to the plate and trying some new things and not really being too concerned about it. Now, like this E16, and we'll talk about that more later, but uh, I'm really enjoying the painting part of that and having to think through that because there's painting a float plane that requires some level of masking is not that much different than any kind of build challenge you might have. Now yeah. I've gotten a lot more comfortable holding it and flipping it around and not thinking it's going to fly in a million pieces. Well, if I drop it, it will, but uh, <laughs> yeah, don't drop it. I won't drop it, but that for me, is still primarily the construction. So my opinion on this has changed much like uh, Dave. When I first started the hobby, I was big into painting and weathering. So I would just build the kit as fast as I could stock out of the box and get to that part that I enjoyed the most. Uh, that was my, I, I've been in the hobby for about 12 years now. So I think the first, you know, seven years I was that way. And I, I would say in the past five years or so, I've changed and I've taken a lot more pleasure in the build aspect, mainly because I have gotten big into super detailing and well, maybe not super detailing, but, you know, increasing the level of detail with aftermarket conversion sets, adding welds and so on, and really like solving the puzzle in making that kit as accurate as possible, often to match a reference photo. That's almost like a separate interest uh, on top of what I love still, which is painting and weathering. So there's a bit of a a new spin on that. And it's really just further slowed down my pro fin my project finish rate because now I, I drag a bunch of tail when I'm also building it along with painting it. But it has definitely changed with my maturity in the hobby and experience grown. Uh, I'm, I, I would say I'm equal parts, uh, an enjoyer of the build and an enjoyer of the uh, painting and weathering, mainly weathering. I think the the part I, I enjoy the least actually is the painting because I, I'm always nervous about airbrushing uh, and, and decaling. Those are the two parts that frighten me as being possible ways to ruin a project. <laughs> I'm sure many people share that. <laughs> Evan, yeah, I just want to point out that I have IPMS USA convention t-shirts that are older than 12 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably underwear too. 
Uh-huh. Well, I, I wasn't going to say that, but you know. <laughs> yes, that's probably true too. Moving on. <laughs> Always a bridesmaid, but never a bride. This is from uh, Jeff Keenan of Buffalo, New York. We all have our must-build subjects. Which one is perennially on your short list, but for some reason or another, it always goes back into the stash and why? I, I'll start this one. Okay. Uh, it's the uh, that Italeri Panzerwerfer 42 I've got. Yep. Yeah, I've got, you know, it's another magnum opus type deal i've got the old Tulare kit i even picked up a a dragon maltier half track to to swap out the the chassis and 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 uh running gear for i've got just a ton of aftermarket for it and i think it's probably because that kit has an interior that i, I want to do that i just get that sucker out and start working through it in my head i'm like oh man i just I can't pull the trigger on this and back it goes. And the box gets more and more packed with more stuff almost every year that I keep buying for that thing and sticking it in there. So it's like, I'm shooting myself in the foot. I'm not making it any easier. Uh, but in my head, I'm making it better. Right. Uh, but it's gone back in the stash. That's been on my short list. Dave and I used to do these lists and that, that one's been on there since the very first one we ever did. Yeah, and that sucker's that box is getting yellow, and uh, <laughs> it's it's pretty old at this point. Evan, I've had the Tamiya Charby One kit, which is oh. by some accounts the best uh, one of the best Tamiya kits ever built because it's it's flawless and the tracks are individual link clickable, uh, so they're not like rubber band, but they're not crazy. And it's a cool uh, tank. I've got that, and I've got a resin conversion to make it one of the uh, German flamethrower variants that they used. A very limited, uh, and there's some cool... These vehicles were used in some units on the Eastern Front, I think, but yep. uh, mainly they actually had them stationed on the Channel Islands as well, so there's some very cool markings for these. And I've just... I've always been just a little bit nervous about starting this project because I know the resin set I have for it isn't perfect. I have to do some conversion uh, to the flamethrower and there's some detailing I want to do to the kit. And I don't really know much about the Char B1. So I, I'd have to get some books for that. And I'm also looking for this out of production echelon decal set for it that I can't find. And I emailed the guy who runs the company and he said he'll reprint it soon. That was like a year ago. I emailed him again. <laughs> Still waiting. So I know. So it's been looming for a while, but I just, I keep putting it aside because I, I don't know all the parts of the puzzle yet. Well, I thought you, I knew where you were going with this. Cause I've got one in my stash too. And I, I know what's kept me from doing it is cause I want to build a French one and it's the camouflage scheme on it. Yeah. Mm. But you get to do a gray one. <laughs> yeah. Well, but there are some paints like these new atom paints I, I testing recently that I've had some projects where I've also put them off because they have hard edge schemes. And now with these paints I tested, it seems like you can airbrush and brush paint them and have the f- same final color, which means that you can just airbrush it tightly freehand and then just take a paintbrush and go back and make that a hard edge. So you don't have to mask it. And I would be really worried about masking over all the photo wetch and yeah, and little resin bits you'd have on a model for sure. So that paint has actually knocked a few kits off of my permanently shelved uh, <laughs> for fear of hard edge camo list because now I have a way to do them. What's yours, Dave? Uh, well, one that I'm going to build this year or that I've been putting off forever is uh, B24D, uh, the Hasegawa kit. Just the massive size of it. Uh, it just, it's, it's big. It's a monster. They've, it's got all that glazing. Of course, you now the canopy masks are widely available. And if I needed to, I could cut my own. Uh, I have no excuses. This goes along to one of the previous questions. Life is getting too short. I've always wanted one or more of these B24Ds built. Uh, I've been putting it off just because it's a massive undertaking as far as the size of the model. And that 
that stops now, that stops in 2024. All right. Well, maybe we'll get some of this stuff built. Yeah. Wrong scale. <laughs> this line gets dropped every time a new subject hits the market. We all have our preferred scale, but is there any subject that might sway you from moving off your preferences? Oh, yes. Lay it on us. Yeah. Um, I Okay. 70 second scale, God's one true scale. Everybody knows all that. If I were to build a car kit, I'd build a 24 scale car kit. I think the spirit of this one would be, since you're primary, primarily an aircraft builder. Aircraft. Right. What aircraft would come out in in another scale other than 72nd that would tempt me? Um, Man, God, you're, hard, you're some, hardcore. Yeah, I've got, <laughs> some, I've got so many 72nd scale kits that, that you know, here's, here's the attitude that I would have in regard to that is if something came out that was unavailable in 72nd scale and it came out in 48th or 32nd, I would look at my stash. I would look at all the kits that I have to build that I want to build. I mean, really on my short list want to build, knowing that those would take several years, I would probably tell myself, by the time I get through all these, somebody's going to do this <laughs> model in 72nd scale. Fair enough. So Dave's sticking to his guns. What about you, Evan? Uh, one of the projects I've always wanted to do is I've seen these photos of T-34s during, I believe it's Operation Uranus, when they encircled Stalingrad, uh, they raided some of those air bases that the Germans were using to keep the city supplied, and they essentially were ramming uh, J-52s with their T-34s to just yep. destroy them. Yep. And there's some photos of T-34s wedged under J-52s. And I'm hoping and praying that border models will continue their 35th scale and do a 35th scale J-52. Probably not going to happen. So an option for me that I've considered would be to do a 48 scale J-52 and a 48 scale T-34. And I'm sure that there's something close enough available by Hobby Boss that I could, you know, put some hauler or other 48 scale photo etch on to make it accurate to my tastes. And I could probably make that that scene also on a smaller scale, uh, a more realistic scale and 48 scale. So that's an example of something in my mind that has had me considering a dirty 48 scale build. <laughs> well, you could do it in both 48 scale and 72nd uh, no. scale. Yeah, but I want to be able to Just see the model, take, right? But, so. Oh, no, take a look at Steve Hustad's dioramas. Yeah, I know. I guarantee he Can showed you me the mall at Nats and it was actually I loved going through each of his projects because yeah. he is a, he's a wizard being able to put so much detail into such a small subject. Yep. But I can imagine what, what a di him doing a diorama of that would. In fact, you ought to send him a pit, just email him a picture or two. That'll get, get him, get him thinking about it. <laughs> I'm still waiting for border though. Holding out. <laughs> it, it, it could happen. Somebody it might could it. happen. That yeah. would be a pretty big kit though. Right. That would be a huge kit. I could just do a wedge, you know, like just the, there you go. The wing or something. That's actually not a bad idea. I've been thinking I could also maybe try to 3D print this or, or scratch build a wing you, or something. But you could scratch is, build a wing. Aren't those made of like that rib duraluminum stuff? The corrugated duraluminum. Yeah. So that's going to be tricky. Well, for me, it's, uh, it, it, you mentioned Steve, and I think that's kind of where this is coming from. Uh, he's kind of talked me into a 72nd scale armor project. So, so yes, I've got a photograph of, I can't remember the tiger unit, but it's sometime in 43, I think. And it's a, a tiger one, an early type rolling, rolling past a, uh, a knocked out KV one S and yep. uh, in, in the I ditch in, in the front of the tank is a German mortar crew, just kind of taking it easy. And the guy's got like the, one of them has the base plate strapped to his back. And the other one, you can see the, uh, the, the barrel carrier for the, for the mortar tube. Speaking and, of that, can you imagine humping a mortar base plate all the way across Russia from the <laughs> Polish border? 
I mean, seriously. Yeah. It'd be <laughs> tough, man. That would be a good diorama. You should do that. So I've got the kits. I've got the Vespid Tiger one. Uh, I've been picking up some of uh, those nice Pricer figures to to do some figure work. Uh, the the KV1S I've got from, uh, who is it, UM? Yeah. Makes all the KVs in the 72nd scale. Don't like it. I, I, I think I'm going to pick up a, a better KV kit from somebody else and, and convert it to a KV1S using the turret from that yeah. thing. And uh, some aftermarket wheels and stuff that are available. But uh, But yeah, that's... That photograph and, and the inspiration I've gotten from Steve over the last couple of years, seeing his work at shows, has uh, made me want to give that a shot. Absolutely. All thumbs. <laughs> yes, that's me. <laughs> You've just shot a killer looking coat of paint on your latest creation. It appears to be dry, so you so to size up the next steps, you begin handling it. No, all no. seems okay until you go to put it down and you release the model and you feel that clingy sensation of skin on sticky paint. Massive thumbprint. What's your next move? One, this does not happen because, because David has learned his lesson the hard way because <laughs> that has happened when I was a younger modeler back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Evan. Um, uh, so when I shoot a coat of paint, I walk away from that model and I don't touch it for 24 hours. Even I don't care what, what fast drying lacquer that I've just painted. I don't care how sure I am that it's a hundred percent dry. I just don't, don't do it. But, were I to do it, you put the model down, you walk away, and you come back the next day when it is dry, and you sand it and buff it and reshoot it. It's n- there. The older I get, the more I learn that there are very few mistakes, accidents, problems that you can't fix. And actually, most of the fixes turn out to be a whole lot easier than you thought they were. So I'm a bit different. Uh, maybe not in this exact scenario, but when I mess up, I cannot walk away. I have to fix it before I can walk away because yes, otherwise that was, it'll haunt me. That was younger me. <laughs> but if I break something, I fix it. I, I will almost like punish myself and say, no, we're not done until we fix the mistake because <laughs> otherwise... And and maybe I've dropped the part, you know, or maybe I need something that's currently still flexible or something. I need to finish it now. It's still fresh in my mind. Now, if I put a thumbprint in the paint, I don't think I could really fix it immediately unless, you know, maybe I could spray on. Like maybe if you had a, a clear coat mess up, you could just hit it with some some lacquer thinner right away to help what when it's still setting, essentially, that can sometimes help. Uh, so with the, with the thumbprint, yeah, it'd have to be a... This is going to be a tomorrow sand reprime paint. Yeah, I think it depends on what kind of paint you used. But it would haunt me all day. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have learned, Evan, everything you described was me 20 years ago. And I've just learned through the hard lesson of time not, not, not to let it haunt me. Just walk away from it, go read a book, and and forget about it, and come back to it fresh the next day. <laughs> I think I did that once, and I forgot about it too much, and then I <laughs> I didn't fix the thing I was supposed to before continuing, and, and for oh. that reason now, I don't trust myself. I will fix any mistake, if possible, I'll fix it right away, because I still am in the situation involved in it. Everything still may be more easy to to solve uh now that i don't get easily frustrated in a way i'm gonna break it like in rage so if that's a if you get really mad then you're gonna break something and make it worse then definitely put it away right it's it's everybody yeah. has their own the way of, of solving it i guess yeah uh, i'm i'm the wait till tomorrow guy because i've had too many just cascade trying to fix something 
the f- yeah. thumbprint. It sucks. I, but I tell you here recently, I can't remember which, which one was it. I think it was the E16. Um, I had a minor one on the underside of uh, the fuselage, right where the uh, wing root for the trailing edges come, come into the, uh, the bottom of the fuselage. And it was another use for those lens, this cloth lens cleaning cloth, lens, cl- lens cloths. Yeah. This cloth, uh, those soft lens cleaning cloths. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the stuff wasn't sticky, but it must've been soft enough to take my thumbprint without actually sticking to my skin. And yeah. uh, I was able to buff it out with that thing. Yep. And I, I got real lucky there because uh, ages ago, if, if I'd had a major paint problem, I would just strip the thing. And if you're using Tamiya paints in particular, it's, that's really easy to do with like 90, 90 plus percent alcohol. It'll come off in like a split second. But the problem is now I'm using like Mr. Surfacer all the time and Tamiya putty all the time. And uh, yeah, you get into where you're going to take a, take out all your, your fill and sand work too. So yeah. um, best to chill out and hopefully you can come back and hit it with some sandpaper and, and reshoot it. So by the way, that's a good point that you make. And again, I, I would argue an argument for walking away. If you make a mistake like that, I think there's a frustration you can get into where you're, where you're like, well, damn, I'll just strip the whole thing. When the, that's not necessary in most cases. That's a, If it's a localized problem, you can localize, fix it, and generally blends into the original paintwork totally fine. You do what? You're at a holiday party making small talk and you're asked what you do for fun. How do you answer? <laughs> and if you do bring up your skill modeling de- endeavors, how do you describe it? And then uh, what about podcasting or YouTube content? Uh, Evan, do you want to go first? Yes, uh, I'll go first. Uh, for me, this mainly actually gets brought up because, uh, be- because of my YouTube channel. Essentially, uh, I will mistakenly make some offhand comment or discussion about me going on vacation to Texas for the nationals or whatever, uh, at my work or something like that. You know, people are like, what do you do? And I basically have to say that I'm a, I, I, I start off by saying usually I'm a niche I'm a celebrity. I'm a very <laughs> niche celebrity in a very niche group on the internet, essentially <laughs> a Z tier celebrity. And people know me in this group. And basically it's, uh, and most of the people I know at my job are also engineers. So they can understand, you know, I like to build skill models and detail them and, and do YouTube videos about it. And people don't really seem to dig into it. They're just like, okay, whatever. Right. I've never had anyone actually hunt me down, though I think it'd be pretty easy uh, to figure out my actual ident- identity online, you know, from my personal <laughs> page on Facebook or whatever. But uh, it's brought up. I don't usually discuss it, though. I don't I don't flaunt it around. I try to keep my my work life isolated from my uh, my hobby life. But it gets brought up and I just say I'm, I'm a I'm a weird I'm a weird niche celebrity in a weird niche part of the Internet. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I don't bring it up. Uh, when they ask what I do for fun, I read history. Uh, I do. I don't bring up the scale modeling, and I think it's probably because it's so difficult to to convey it's not like oh well i golf or i play tennis or i it, it's more along the lines of i collect postage stamps or i collect coins or you know one of those hobbies that are uh more about collecting and mm. and it just i i just don't bring it up if somebody asks what i do for fun I really, I don't generally mention scale modeling. I used to be bashful about it and not talk about it too much. I don't care anymore. <laughs> I've got. Yeah, because you're using your 3D printer at work. To... No, not anymore. <laughs> I got my own. He's got okay. his own. Yeah. And yeah. a wash station. <laughs> I. Everybody in my current job knows what I do. 
they know I have the podcast. In fact, a bunch of them were listening to it while they're down in Florida at the last launch, which was kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm it's it's what I do. It's it's so much a part of me at this point that uh I don't know, no sense being bashful about it. Now your your work colleagues, you said they're mainly people more my age. Most and of, they're probably yeah. mostly engineers. So I expect that they would have some understanding of Warhammer and other stuff like that, that would give them some insight into what you do if you were explaining that you were. Well, that's true. Some of them are Yeah, same gamers. for me. Like people my age, I say, you know, I build models kind of like Warhammer, but historical stuff. Interesting. And that's a way to, that's a way to spin it. I, I see, found to help people understand. Yeah. See, you all, you all associate with young engineers, whereas I associate with old, old lawyers and none <laughs> yeah. of None of them would understand any of that. The key thing is, say, you build scale models, not I do modeling, because then they think of something else. It's something completely <laughs> different. You're right. What's your only fans page? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, guys, let's do one more. All right. And yep. then get on with some of our other segments. Crap, I dropped a part. Oh, You're into the nitty gritty of your latest detailing effort, and oops, a part fell to the floor or zings from the grass of your tweezers into oblivion. What protocol do you implement? The first step is to check your clothes. Yes. Because sometimes sometimes you, you drop a part, and then you stand up to find it, and then you hear it <laughs> bounce down across the carpet or the floor. Yep. So first, you check your pockets. It could fall into a pocket. Check all the crevices of your clothes, and then stand up. Yep. And then I get my flashlight. I got a very bright flashlight, and you work it from all the different angles. And you, I just work circular out from beneath me, and eventually I find it, or I give up and I scratch both apart, <laughs> and then I find it. <laughs> and how long you look? is directly related to how hard that part would be to scratch build. Yes. And how uh, many times I, have you later found the part after you completed the build? Yes. Now, one of my buddies, he told me he, he actually gets his wife to come take a look because he says that for some reason, an outside view, essentially, of your workspace is much better at finding it than you. Apparently he's had great luck with her finding it very quickly. Maybe she has good eyes, but hmm. he said that she's actually been, I don't know, maybe she's not always looking at the mess under the table like you are. So I don't know, something to consider. Yeah. Well, my, my procedure is similar to, to Evans. First look at your clothes and look, look at the workspace because Sometime a part zings off. You think it's gone onto the floor and it's actually on your yeah. modeling space. I've so, had that. I've looked out on the floor and then I get up. <laughs> once I've given up, I get back into my workbench and it's sitting right, right there. there. Yeah. <laughs> Number two is look where you're about to put your feet before you go looking for the part. So when or after, where the wheels of your chair are about to slide. Yeah, exactly. Slide if you've got yes. if you've got a rolling chair, don't move the wheels <laughs> until you crunch. Yeah. But then the procedure is much the same. Once I've I've looked at the space where I'm gonna put my feet, I do that, I put my feet, then I get down with a bright flashlight. And if you lay it on the floor so that everything casts even the tiniest speck of scrap, dirt, toenail, whatever, casts a really long shadow. A lot of times that helps you find the a real small part. And that's a good reason to frequently vacuum under your workbench. Yes. So that when you eventually drop something, you will have an easier time finding it with that method than just finding every other bit of crap under your workbench <laughs> yes. with the shadows of your flashlight. Yep. And I am not as good about that as I should be. And, and there's nothing worse than, Oh, one other thing I do also do is I have a broom and a dustpan. Yeah. So I will, if I can't locate the part, I will sweep under my, 
all around the floor around my my uh, chair and then sweep it into the dustpan and then look through the dustpan for the part because many times while you you don't see it it gets picked up when you when you sweep I haven't done that but I've considered not actually done but I've considered doing what people do when they uh, they clean up static grass which is they put a stocking. Mm -hmm. over like a vacuum cleaner and i've got a very small vacuum i use just for cleaning up resin dust and so on essentially and i could i've thought about putting a some nylon or something over that you know thin fabric and then essentially vacuuming and it it should get stuck to the outside of that yes like when people clean up static grass yep i've heard of people doing that i've never done it but yeah mike i do all those things usually check the clothes first yep i've even Learn to check the forelock of my hair. Oh man, because <laughs> I've had a part hanging in there before. <laughs> that's a new. That's a new one. Uh, if it's not there, and I'm fairly certain it went to the floor, I will do what you suggested, Dave. I'll figure out where I'm going to put my feet, and then I usually don't roll my chair. I pick it up and I move yep. it like two feet away from my workbench because it yep. probably didn't go that far. Yep. And then I have an old school draftsman's brush that used to brush uh oh yeah usually eraser dust off a, a hand drawn blueprint or something like that. Hand drawn technical drawing. Yeah. Uh real soft horsehair brush, long bristles, really dense, and I get down and I sweep that in a dustpan. I usually find it. The the yep. I tell you what for me, what's worse than the floor is if, if it pings off and goes toward the, the far side of my workbench. Because then I've got all this stuff back there at the back end of my workbench that yeah. it, it yeah. can get down in a in my flexi file holder or my brush jar or whatever. And man, you can almost never find it then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's the latest edition of the Wheel of Accidental Wisdom. I hope we've had some accidental wisdom. I, I really like your new uh, your new formula there of having more situational questions. I think that was that's very good. I like that. All right. Well, hopefully we'll get some more submissions. We got a, got about oh two fifths of my original list left, and some of those are our, my creations, and some of them are submissions I've pulled out of old old emails. So if you if you'd like to submit something new, you can write the situation if you want, or I'll just take your question and fabricate something around it. But uh, send those to us at uh, plasticmodelmojo at gmail dot com. Guys, it's the Benchtop Halftime Report, and uh, it's going to be brought to us by Squadron Hobby. Add into your stash since 1968, and it's good to hear from Brandon last episode. And uh, go check out squadron.com and see what they got going on. Dave, let's start with Evan. Yeah, let's start with Evan. It's a much happier. <laughs> <laughs> Evan, what's on your bench? Uh, so I recently finished my Panzer Three that I've been working on for about a year. Now I finished the the tank all done i i still want to put it on a small base and have a figure with it those are not done those are not even really started but i at least finished a project so that felt very good and it got me motivated to start something new because you always need something new on the workbench even then when i have you know 10 other started projects so i i had this kit that i bought for a low price at a swap meet it's a hobby boss z s b89 a chinese modern apc it's it's like a chinese knockoff of a bmp1 kind of but it has a machine gun turret and i bought this because it's a really basic kit and i was thinking i would do it during one of our local speed builds with the ipms chapter here and i wanted to do an ethiopian vehicle because they have cool camouflage and i was researching that and then i quickly realized that the kit does not accurately model the Ethiopian version. I would need a new turret, which is not available at all in any kit aftermarket resin because this Type 89 thing is, no one cares about it basically. It's just nothing, right? Uh, So I was thinking, okay, how can I build this kit and make it interesting? Because I don't usually build out of the box. I want to make something a little bit unique and did some more research and I found that the Chinese experimented with mounting an actual BMP-1 turret on the Chinese Type 85 APC. Now, I have a Type 89, which is almost exactly the same thing. I think it's got different tracks, different engine, 
and it's like 12 inches shorter, but they look identical. So I thought, okay, I'll do like a what if, put the BMP1 turret on this Type 89 thing. Now it really looks like a BMP1, but it's a little different still. And so I basically, I turned this very basic kit that I planned to build very basically into a whole project. I redid all the welds, cut panels out of the roof and moved the hatches around. Of course, added BMP1 turret. I replaced all the tool clamps with uh, with 3D printed tool clamps because I found tool clamps that look like Chinese tool clamps. I went the whole way and... Uh, I got a lot of good practice actually with sanding and filling because this kit has a lot of big locating marks for the tools and for plastic options for bits that they also give photo etch for. And I want to use the photo etch and I want to use aftermarket clamps. So I had to fill all these huge locating tabs on the sides of the hull. Also, I did surgery on the roof. So I had to fill a bunch of stuff there. And I got a lot of good practice for my future airplane builds because there was six layers of putty, three layers of primer, you know, sanding between each one. And eventually I got it looking really good, but I had never put so much effort into sanding and smoothing and polishing before. And it was good practice. So uh, that was my main thing for the past couple of weeks. Uh, just kind of randomly getting heavily invested in, in like 1990s Chinese amphibious IFVs and APCs, but it was pretty cool. And I got so invested that I then ordered uh, another Chinese modern APC and uh, it's at Dave's house that he's going to bring it to me for heritage con, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that's what's in that package. <laughs> <laughs> I've also, um, I've also had some figures that I've kind of, mounted and gotten ready to start painting because my new plan for this year is I want to get more of my projects with a, a paired with a figure or two and on a small base because that's a nicer way to present a model. So I do plan to do that. I've got a bunch of figures for current projects. I've pinned them. Some of them are primed and I'm just waiting to actually start figure painting, which I haven't done in a couple of years. And uh, Mike's helping me with the Russian uniforms. <laughs> oh, listen, Mike uh, Mike can tell you more about Russian uniforms than you'd ever want to know. <laughs> he gave me more info than I need. So yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I think I'm pretty much set there. Oh, that's good. Uh, I've also got something else I've just started on, but we can get to that when we get to the wallet broken oh. section <laughs> later on. Mike, your yours is also going to be happier than mine. Oh, you may have a short one then, I guess, Dave. Yeah, that's right. Well, the big news is I've finished and submitted the Musaru Cup build. Yep. And uh, that was a lot of fun. I'm glad it's over. I'm probably not going to dish on that till an episode after right. after the judging's all done and they select select the winner for this year. Uh, but most folks, I think, have probably seen it. It's been on the dojo. You put it on the dojo. And yep. I, yep. I, I put it on the Musaru Cup page. Short of it is, it was a, done as a Hot Wheels car in the, in the retail packaging. <laughs> which is an idea we hatched on the car ride down to nationals last year when we opened yes. that kit up in the car. Yep. And I uh, was glad to see that all work out in the end. You actually, uh, that's a very creative presentation. And you came up with, you came up with that idea in like 30 minutes. Basically yes. you basically opened it up, saw what it was. And that might've been the first idea in your mind. And it is fantastic because shortly afterwards you told us Dave and, and myself, what you were going to do. And we thought that's awesome. And that's what you did. Yeah. It came off exactly as you, as you described it. Well, I got a lot of nice comments from folks uh, on one of our group chats and then on the, on the moose root page. And then on our, on the plastic model dojo page, I appreciate all that. It came out nice. I'm really pleased with it, but uh, we'll see what the Hamilton guys see what they like. Is there a couple of builds yet to be finished and a couple others that I think are pretty good too. So uh, yeah, it's pretty, Pretty some pretty good competition this year. Yep. In addition to that, I'm well into painting the E16. Yay! Uh, I've got most of the underside Imperial Japanese Navy gray on it. Um, it's on the undersides of the wings and the and the horizontal stabilizer and the bottom of the fuselage. Uh, once, well, the next part for that is to get the where that color wraps around on the fuselage sides. 
and also on the pontoons. I got to paint the bottoms of the pontoons and there's some wraparound color of the light gray on that too. Yeah. Uh, got to get all that done. And then it's uh mask that sucker off and again, and uh, do the top side green. Now with the gray being, uh, being a light color and I'm thinning it about 70% thinner, 30% paint. So it's right. Cause it, you did a lot of, it's uh, pretty thin pre shading and, and yeah. panel shading that you you don't want to simply cover over. That, that was more than pre shading. That was pre saturating mm -hmm. using multiple different hues, which I think is really impressive. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that worked out nice. There's a few panels I think might lean a little yellow, but you know that Imperial Japanese navy gray has got a green kind of cast to it. Yes, it does. Yeah. So yep. um, I think once the weathering's on it it'll be all right i'm, I'm not going to put any more gray on the bottom except where <laughs> there's not any yet like the bottoms of the floats right uh now on the top side i, I don't know because that imperial japanese navy green is pretty dark it's it's a very pigment dense color so again i was talking to steve Eustad about what i was doing there and uh he suggested i lighten the color anyway yep and, I agree uh, with him. I'll probably do that. And then uh, I don't know if it'll be 70, 30. I may do some experimentation and see just how far down I can take that and still get, still, still have it be effectively paint. Right. Right. Well, uh, that's what scrap plastic is made for. Yeah. Well, I, I've got my paint mule tool too. So yeah. um, maybe 80, 20, I don't know. 85, 15, uh, 90, 10, even, I don't know. <laughs> Could go either way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying that. Um, just getting back into my comfortable, again, getting comfortable in my own skin with, with the painting and airbrushing. Because when I was doing the railroad cars, that was like second nature. Pretty fearless. And uh, of course, those aren't typically very hard. I mean, a lot of them are one color even. Right. Uh, and But I was doing some locomotives on commission that were a lot more complicated than a, than a rail car. But this this has taken a lot of uh, a lot of masking tape. Oh, it does. The aircraft models take a lot of masking. Yeah, there's no question. Uh, other than those two, I don't think I've done much else. The well, uh, you've got one more. You've got the the KV eighty five base. Where, you, uh, but I've only I've only base coated the ties in dark gray. Right, and so, you your next step is to what? I got to do some modeling of uh, light gray. I've got a my notes say it's. Uh, to me a sky gray or yeah it's a sky gray and buff or white and buff i can't remember i got it written down somewhere uh in fact i have the paint mixed up in a dropper bottle already so that's the next step and that's going to yeah. take a while um yeah i'm also thinking about putting the the uh the finished sides on the on the base before i get too much further i think after i paint the ties and rails i'm going to do that yeah well i think i think that's the way the night shift tends to do it just as a, a reference point. So that's what I've been working on. Dave, what have you not been working on? Yeah, I was going to say, boy, c compared to that, mine is rather sad. Uh, I, the, the last two or three weeks uh, between work, which uh, the, this is a busier time of year for us attorneys, uh, between finally starting to cut stuff with the cameo to get used to the software and, and stuff like that and rearranging my model room because I wasn't making progress. And I figured out that the way my model room was, was set up was part of the problem. I haven't made a ton of progress on the actual bench top. What I did do is uh, I've got more progress made on the LCM3 weathering. Uh, in fact, I'm to the point where another good session or two, and that's going to be done. I finished the engine for the A7M, and I really like the way it came out. Now, in theory, it's going to be hidden behind an impeller, kind of like the impeller on a Focke-Wulf 190, the radial engine Focke-Wulfs. They had the uh, impeller fan in front of, behind the spinner in front of the engine face to help increase cooling. 
this aircraft actually had that uh, that same setup. So a lot of that engine may not be visible, but really, I I, I kind of wanted to do it just to, to play with it. I'm not a big fan of normally of of adding or painting detail that nobody's going to be able to see, but I kind of made an exception in this case because I want to get better with painting and weathering engines. Uh, and trying to get a more realistic look out of them. So I did that. And uh, that's about it. That's about it. Not as, not a lot of progress, but I'm going to... I I Mike, I think I'm going to have to use you as my accountability buddy again and start committing to getting a certain number of bench hours a week <laughs> because that really did work when we did it just as an experiment. So I think I'm going to try that again. You heard him, Mike crack the whip, but don't, don't promise me you're going to finish stuff. Cause we don't want to make uh that's right. I don't want to write checks. My body can't cash. That's right. Don't want Don to have to write in again. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Keep you straight, man. Well, I'm assuming that the three of us have been buying some modeling-related items. That has been known to happen, yes. <laughs> yes. Has anybody's wallet gotten broken? Uh, mine took some hits All uh, right. over oh, the past month well, or but so. But that's Canadian money. That's not yeah, even... Yeah, monopoly you know, money. Yeah, really. It's not like real spending. So what did, what did you, what did you uh, spend your plastic money on? All right, so it's a bit of a story here. Okay. Not too long. Um, I was scrolling Facebook about uh, around the holidays, actually, and uh, there's a Canadian buy, sell, trade Facebook group. And someone was – they posted some kits that they were looking to get rid of, and they actually wanted to trade instead of sell, and they posted some kits that they would like in exchange. And one of the kits that, that they had in exchange where they were looking for in exchange – was one of the kits that, as I previously mentioned, uh, I decided I was not going to build and I was looking to get rid of. So I contacted the guy, said, I've got one of the kits you're looking for. And one of the kits he had caught my eye. And I was entirely prepared to be shipping these things across the country. And turns out the guy lived about 10 minutes down the street in the same city as me. So <laughs> same evening, just drove over there and swapped the kits. and Sweet. <laughs> Uh, Canada's a big country, so it could have been, you know, a, a, a lot further than that. But <laughs> while you were over there, did you paw through his stash? Just to... <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, the kit that he had is a Meng uh, VDV Typhoon K4386, which probably no one knows what that is. It's basically a modern Russian MRAP. Right. Four-wheeled armored car with a remote weapon station. I had never seen it before, but it caught my eye, and so I traded it for a kit that I didn't want to build. So I'm, I'm, you know, uh, there we go. And the kit actually is more expensive, much more expensive than the kit that I traded for. So you know, I've made a profit, right? Yep. Uh, and then I started doing research, which I'm started, sure you'll doing... report on your taxes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I started doing research, and then it turns out that the main kit builds the prototype. And uh, I actually wanted to do the in-service model. And then the aftermarket started to flow in. So uh, despite me making about 50 bucks profit on the trade, uh, then I spent about $170 in aftermarket. Because <laughs> I needed a, a new rear, a new hood, a new front grill, a new turret, new wheels. And then I also got the the Quinta interior dash set and the Quinta seat belts for all seven seats. And that stuff adds up pretty quick. Yes, it does. And uh, also, a lot of these, because this is a modern Russian vehicle, uh, some of these aftermarket sets are only produced by Russian manufacturers. And, you know, you can't order from Russia anymore. So right. it was not easy to find some of these, but the, they were some of them were still in stock you know, in Australia or places where they'd obviously made it out before the sanctions. So right. 
I was able to get everything I need. And I'm looking forward to actually trying Quinta Studio for the first time because I've heard some good things. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, it's some really neat stuff. It's a neat technology. So this will be my first major resin conversion. And uh, I've actually already started slicing some parts off the kit just to play around with it. But it's looking pretty good. The, the Meng base kit is excellent. So what what is your ultimate plan for that? Are you doing one? I know a couple of them were knocked out in Ukraine. Yes, these vehicles are are not very common. Uh, right. It's it's a VDV exclusive vehicle, so that's the Russian paratroopers, right? Right. Uh, uh, so I found a few photos of them in Ukraine, uh, mainly on the side of the road, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I'm probably going to do something like that. I, I want to do something relatively tasteful, but we'll see. I don't want to do any of those, you know, gory ambushed right. convoys. So we'll see. Uh, it's a cool vehicle, and I have been interested in doing some Ukraine war stuff. So we'll see how that goes. Well, that's a nice start. We'll see if I get canceled on uh, on YouTube for building a, a modern Russian vehicle. So did you buy anything else? Uh, no, that was... That was pretty much That was enough, off. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mike, what's your wallet look like? Uh, not not too bad. Well, there's one big one on there, but the small ones are small order from Burbank House of Hobbies. I picked up some Vallejo plastic putty to try to help fill the gap I found in the E16 front canopy. Yep. Uh, that was not enough. It's one of those sh- scope creep because the shipping was too much on just the one item. Right. So I picked yep. up a Kagero book on the uh, Arado 196 float plane. Mm-hmm. That'll come in useful later. Yep. Uh, I bought a couple different thicknesses of Pet G. It's polyester plastic already cut in five by five squares from a vacuum former. Right. Been putting that to use. Uh, the big ticket item was I picked up that quad Bofors and 35th scale from Zimmy Models. That kit's a mixed bag, man. Yeah, you said you said that it was. Yeah, it's it's interesting that that you know it's the gun tub and the gun. Well, the, on the inside face of the gun tub are all these ammo racks for all the Bofors four round clips. Right, and there's probably close to a hundred of them on there, and they give you the photo etch to make the racks. Uh, but the kit only comes with six. Is it six or twelve? 12, 12 clips doesn't matter. <laughs> neither six. It's not going to last them very long, right? Neither six nor twelve is going to going to fill up the ammo racks. Now there's a blurb on the box about metal upgrade available separately, but I've not seen that on the market yet. And I bet you that doesn't have a hundred hundred clips worth of, of rounds in it either. So uh, it's a little disheartening because the box art shows the uh, ammo sto- storage completely full. Uh, once you get the to the part of the instructions where you build up the ammo racks. They never show you putting them in, but all the subsequent isometric drawings of the kit being assembled have all the ammo racks full and all the painting guide has the ammo racks full. So I don't know. So it's kind of the second time uh, one of these new kits out of Asia has had something in the CAD work, if not on the box art and in the instructions that actually wasn't in the kit. Uh, the other is the Vespid Tiger One kit in 72nd scale. Now, I guess it's a tiny detail. Maybe they just didn't have a way to do it. Uh, but that kit's missing the track change cable, which is kind of a signature Tiger One kind of hull fitting, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, it's it's in the CAD on the side of the box. The kit has all the all the mounting points for that cable molded onto the hull side, but there's no cable. So you got a little work to do there if you want to have the track change cable on that kit. But again, I don't know what's up with the Zimmy Bofors kit. The kit detail wise is okay. It's not great. Um, the thing that stands out the most in my mind is the gun shield. It's got all the rivet detail on the outward facing side, but on the inside, there's no rivets. The other side of the rivets aren't there. The batten strips for the rivets aren't there. Right. Um, so if you want to, and it's going to be visible. Oh, that's way visible. Yeah. So you're going to want to fix that. But still, it's it's an interesting subject, and I think the scale's kind of a good scale for it. Yeah. Maybe there's be some figure sets come out for it soon. Oh, I, I, I'm sure there will. Well, what have you bought, Dave? Well, actually, the one upside of me not getting much done on the bench is that I haven't been out spending a lot 
for uh, modeling either. I really, the only thing I bought in the last three or four weeks was I was at Michael's and uh, I I was picking up some cheap brushes because I'm doing some glass etching related to the cameo where I'm I'm trying to come up with plastic model mojo whiskey tumblers. So I needed some cheap brushes. So I went over there to get cheap brushes uh, to put on the, the etching paste on the glass. And while I was there, their entire model section was 40% off. And they had Bandai Star Wars kits and they had a Bandai X-Wing. And, you know, I can see myself eventually doing one of those. So 40% off was something that I couldn't pass up. So I went ahead and bought it. Got your trigger point. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what they did. And so I ended up with that. So now I have a Star Wars X-Wing, which is the only Star Wars kit in my entire stash. But that's all I bought. No, it's not. He forgot something, Evan. What did I forget? You bought a clear prop MiG-23. Oh, God, yes, you're right. <laughs> Your wallet's you're... still steaming from that. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. How did I, I, I must have blanked that out of my memory. It was so traumatic. Yeah, it was, because it was not cheap. The one th- I love clear prop. I love the stuff they do. I like their their subject matter. Their kits are really nice kits, but they're not cheap. And the local hobby shop had a uh, MiG-23 ML or MLA that was a retail price of like $57. I, I'm a sucker for the MiG-23. Now this isn't the version that I want. I'm hoping that they're going to the to release the original MiG 23 M or MF, uh, which was the first fighter version, whereas the ML or MLA was one of the later versions. So the Flogger G as opposed to the Flogger as opposed to the Flogger C. But yeah, you're right, Mike. I'm, I'm the trauma must have caused me to <laughs> to completely blank. Now, the plus side is you can do both Cuban and North Korean MiG-23s, and both of those schemes are pretty cool. So having opened up the box and looked, they clearly have designed the kit so that they're eventually going to do all of the versions of the MiG-23 slash MiG-27 family. Now, the downside of that is the construction is broken down into some really weird parts configurations. So I think this kit is going to be a whole lot more difficult to build than it would otherwise be if the molds were designed just to do the one version of the, of the aircraft. But yes, thank you for reminding me, Mike. Again, I, I, the trauma of paying that much money and then looking at that kit and seeing how much work it's going to be, I think the trauma probably caused me to blank. So thank you for reminding me. So you're going to have it done for HeritageCon? Yes, I'll have it done for HeritageCon. Sure. Gentlemen, we are at the end of the episode. I am assuming that we are also all at the end of our modeling fluid. Evan, how was that German beer? It was absolutely fantastic. One of the best beers I've ever had. Again, that was the Actian Zwickau Keller beer. So a nice, hazy, unfiltered, kind of ambery lager. Just absolutely fantastic. Let's let's face it. The central Central Europeans know their beer. Yeah, especially the Germans. The Germans really do know their beer, so it didn't surprise me that it turned out to be good. Hamilcar, great job! And if you want to mail beer to me, you're welcome to mail beer to me at any time. <laughs> if he's coming to Nazi, better pack that check bag full. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs>
<laughs> so, Mike, uh, uh, I think we can assume that the bullet was good, although compared to the Russells, I'm sure it was not quite the same experience. Well, it was that other one I had, which I, the name is escaping me. Oh, the... Uh, oh, Pursuit. Yeah, the Pursuit. The Pursuit was kind of sweet. So coming back to this spice-heavy, rye-heavy bourbon, that's, that's what it is. It's just, it's it's good. After a couple of sips, I was fine. It's like an old friend was back, but not the same experience. I completely understand. Uh, the Ace Pear Cider was fantastic. It always is. Uh, again, I'm I, I'm a cider fan, so I enjoy ciders. And Ace Pear is just a really, really good cider. And again, five percent alcohol by volume, so very, very light. Uh, you're not gonna. It's not gonna hit you in the back of the head or anything. So good experience. <laughs> Okay, Mike, now we are truly at the end of the episode. Uh, do we have shout outs? Evan, do you have a shout out? Yes, I'm going to have two shout outs today. All right, shout them out. First of all, no surprise, Mr. Hamilton Barkas, my good friend Michael, thank you very much for sending me the beer and other goodies. It was very much appreciated. I've still got one beer left. And uh, I, I did return the favor and, and dipped into the Canadian Maple Reserve and sent some <laughs> stuff back to Michael. Is that is that part of the stuff you helped steal from the reserve in the big heist? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I did not send him any beer because I didn't want to invoke the, the wrath of the Germans and start a third world war. But That's right. Uh, German beer, top, top quality. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Uh, second shout out is a quick one to our very own Mike. Thank you very much for the references for the Russian uniform. Oh, anytime. I guess it's good to have connections to people who have uh, uh, good reference photos and so on. (laughs) (laughs) Even if I take my own. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Mike has forgotten more about Russian uniforms than you and I will ever know. Oh, man. (laughs) So, Mike, do you have any shout outs? Uh, Yeah, I want to shout out Inch, man. Jeff Groves. (laughs) rabbit hole time <laughs> i know and I'll, I'll dish on it a little bit here uh i've got you know the, uh, who was i listening to the, oh the model geeks they're talking about kitty hawk back zimmy models is actually molding and boxing and and still into the kitty hawk banner selling all those 30 second scale planes again and right uh d ran had, was waiting on his kingfisher to arrive and you know i've already got one of those right and I want to do one in 30 second scale. I want to do one in 70 second scale. Uh, the 70 second scale one for sure is a catapult on a gun turret. Uh, yeah. The BB 38 turret from the Pennsylvania. Yep. Or the Arizona is very similar. Right. Uh, I got to thinking how big would a BB 38 be in 30 second scale? <laughs> and as it turns out, it's not as big as you might think it is because those ships by. What was the other class later in the war? Iowa class, is that right? Well, the, the Iowa did, right. They're, they're, you had the the fast battleships, the North Carolinas and the Alabamas, and then you had the big Iowas and the, Missouri, the Iowa, Missouri, and New Jersey. Right. So point being, that turret for the Pennsylvania class ships, now this is not with the guns, just the turret, is just under 17 inches long. In 30 seconds. In 30 seconds scale. So that's still pretty big, Mike. Yeah. It is, but it's it's not like, oh God, there's no way that'll fit on my bench big. Yeah, true enough. True enough. So uh, it, to make a long story short, I asked Inch for some uh, basic dimensions just for the you know the feasibility stuff on the front end, right? Is this is this like totally ridiculous or is this kind of possible? <laughs> And then he opened the fire hose. And then he opened a fire hose and he started sending me all these pictures. He's got books and we're going to see him in Columbus on Saturday. So uh, I got to take his books on the Japanese stuff back and he's going to bring me some stuff on Pennsylvania and Arizona class uh, at the show. And uh, I don't know. We'll see if this actually goes anywhere. That's <laughs> a research rabbit hole. That's my shout out. Jeff Groves. I can't wait. I can't wait. Thank you, Inch. I, I I knew that would happen the moment he contacted you. Thank you for uh, 
Thank you for being the person I I knew you were. I've got two shout outs. One, again, the mid-Michigan modelers. Again, I apologize. Y'all have the first show in Region 4, and uh, I'm assuming you'll have the first show next year in Region 4. And the second shout out is kind of a sad one. Friend of the podcast, Tom Choi, uh, recently posted on Facebook uh, where he had to put to sleep his longtime companion, Dog. Having had to do that a number of times over the years, it never gets easy. We don't deserve dogs, and uh, when it's their time and you have to, to let them go, it's tough. So deep sympathies on, on your loss, man. Well, Evan, thanks for joining us again on Plastic Model Mojo. Thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure, especially with the wheel. It's always a, a great center of discussion. <laughs> And four weeks from now, man, we're going to be seeing each other. Yep, Heritage Con. Cannot That's right. wait. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to all my kits being brought to me. That's if the Canadians will let us across the border. Mike and I got lucky last year. Well, Dave, as we always say. So many kits. So little time. Take it easy, man, and we'll see you soon, Evan. You got it. Take care. Take care.